I always wonder what part of this interview that you're going to have in the beginning. I never know. And then I was standing there with nothing but a New Jersey net jersey on. It's not going to be that. Tyler. And then I said, do you love me? There's two things that we need to do to make a difference in our career. Take really good care of patients and to teach other people how to take really good care of patients. And that was probably the most influential call I've ever had in my career. Because then we took that same patient and we brought them to the morgue and we put them in a bag and we put them up on a shelf. Welcome to Medic Mindset. I'm Ginger Locke. In this episode, I talked to Tyler Christofoli. When I thought of how to introduce him, I got a little stuck because he doesn't fit neatly in any boxes. And that's what I love about him. It's accurate to call him a flight medic, but he's so much more. He's a podcaster and an EMS educator. And in listening to his podcast, I knew he was a sharp guy, but being in the same room with him is a completely different animal. He has charisma for days, but what mesmerizes me the most is watching him bring out the best in others. In this episode, we have a few cameos as well. Dr. Jeff Jarvis drops in, as well as Tyler's childhood friend, Jay Nance. There are show notes for this one, and I recommend checking them out at medicmindset.com. I want everyone to know Tyler Christofoli. If you haven't met him before, allow me to introduce one of the sharpest and kindest minds in EMS. I feel like we're siblings, podcasting siblings, if you will. I believe we are. I think we are. We both do it because we can't not. Do you know what I mean by that? Absolutely. Yeah. I I think once you start podcasting, it's really hard to stop it because you get addicted to the response of putting out a new podcast and seeing how different people connect with that podcast and how people interpret that podcast You release it and you work really hard on it and then you see the comments and you see some good comments and some negative comments, but there's still comments, there's still engagement. And my wife the other day, I was working on that Making the Cut podcast that I just put out and I was trying to find videos and time the videos with the audio and trying to get it all evenly timed out and I spent hours working on that. And she's like, I've never seen you so like passionate about something that you're not even getting paid for. It doesn't matter because you put something out. People say, I got a, I got a, a message the other day on Facebook from a guy I barely even know who said, Tyler, I just want to let you know, like, I was kind of feeling like unmotivated and I felt like my drive for EMS was starting to drop a little bit. And I started listening to some of your stuff and you just picked up that that motivation I needed, and I really appreciate it. And I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was so cool to hear that. And I, I went over to my wife, and I showed her. And I was like, hey, look at this. I don't even know this guy. And yeah. he said that I motivated him. Yeah. All of a sudden, all those hours you spent on it is now worth it again. And you're motivating your peers, too, myself included. And I want to thank you for that. I talked to your wife. Did she tell you? No, she didn't. Yes, she did. Okay. No, I didn't know that. I talked to her, and I asked her, what it's like to live with you. Oh, God. <laughs> and she, here's her response. I'm going to read it because I want to get it accurate. She said, Tyler is enthusiastic and high energy, and that never stops. From the moment he wakes up, and I think we kind of know this about you, he's on a mission to learn. It's 24-7, his face in the books, and even though it can drive a wife nuts when I just want him to come to bed, his brain fascinates me at the same time. I wouldn't be surprised if one day he goes to med school There's no limit to the amount of medical knowledge he wants to take in. He eats, breathes, and sleeps medicine. So, med school? I would absolutely love to go to med school. And I know she knows that, too. I think that's cool that she says that because I feel like it's more of an annoyance at some point because, you know, she'll be laying there in bed and I'll turn the brightness on my phone all the ways down (laughs) and I'll just be reading different studies and scrolling through it. And some nights I have the calculator out and I'm trying to figure out stuff and... 
And she looks over. And she's like, go to bed. What are you doing? And she takes my phone. You know, who are you talking to? And she looks and it's a Medscape that's up or, you know, up to date or, you know, I'm lo- reading some study or I'm answering somebody's question. And Yeah. And this has um, come up for me recently because you're in my life. I've also started getting a little bit deeper pathophys. Um, you've inspired me. Thank you for that. And I want to ask you a question, something that came up. I went to a review course for an FPC review course, Flight Bridge Ed puts on. Ashley and Eric Bauer came to Austin. Eric talked about this idea that patients will show you death signs. And that's what he called it. And I never heard that, that phrase before. What do you see in a patient that makes you think, Ooh, I need to put the defib pads on or stuff's about to change. Are there patterns that you see? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Initially, you know, we go through school and we're taught that we're going to see these uh, patients that are have this impending doom that's upon them. And I, I think that's kind of a load of crap. There's a couple things that I see. So a patient that's in respiratory distress, a raising end title really concerns me. Mm-hmm. A patient that's septic cold extremities make me concerned. A patient that has any sort of cardiogenic shock, it's all about the diastolic blood pressure. And those are really, if I had to sum it up into three main points, it's the diastolic blood pressure, because that's my coronary perfusion pressure. Adrenaline can peak a systolic pressure, but that diastolic pressure is what's going to feed the coronary arteries. The cold extremities, Hippocrates, said the patient with cold extremities scares me something like that i don't remember exactly what he said and then the patient that has a rising end title that really concerns me as well because that means they're starting to tire out a little bit and arrest may be imminent but as far as um other signs you know I, i don't feel like anything really sticks out to me as much as those three that's good stuff. One one of the things you mentioned, this cold extremities, reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, J.R. Pickett, who has a podcast, the Austin Travis County OMD, Office of the Medical Director Yeah, podcast. absolutely. I love that podcast. Yeah, he's a character. He talked about a nurse taught him during his, his residency. They'd see the patient roll in, and she or, she or he, the nurse, could identify dead feet. Basically, they'd see the feet, and they're like, that's a critical patient, just looking at the the feet. That's interesting. I was going to say, earlier we were talking a little bit, ankles are a big thing for me. If I go up to a patient, and I'm trying to figure out, Jay Nance, my buddy sitting right here next to me, asked me the other day, how do you distinguish between COPD, exacerbation, and like CHF? And honestly, a lot of them can present very similar, especially in the latter phases of the disease process. And I really, I look at their ankles because if a patient has edematous ankles and edematous extremities, I know that there's something going on with the perfusion. And I know that they're starting to get a little bit of a congestive uh, backup in the venous system. And so that's something I looked at. And I got in the habit of looking at everybody's ankles. I'm the ankle man. (laughs) I just got my title. (laughs) The ankle man? (laughs) (laughs) That's that's going to be in the beginning. <laughs> I'm the ankle man. I played this creative game the other night. I was thinking of questions I wanted to ask you. In fact, I'm often thinking of things I want to ask you, and I purposely don't text you because I figure there's hundreds of people texting you. No, you need to text their me. They're clinical questions. So I texted Jarvis, Dr. Jeff Jarvis. It was a reductionist game. I like to reduce things down to their core guiding mission, like what's our purpose in EMS? What are we? What's our true north star? What are we trying to do? And instead of just asking that question, I, I asked Dr. Jarvis, I said, if you could only have five meds on your trucks, right, traveling around his counties where he's the medical director, which five meds would you leave? And he sent me his list, and I'd like to hear yours. I think that is such a great question because – it really causes you to dig down deep into what is evidence-based, what are we using the most, and how can we get creative with those medications. So I think if I had to pick five medications, the first one would be aspirin because that has got the most evidence-based behind it. It actually works. We know it works, and I think that would be number one. Number two would be ketamine because I love ketamine, and I think that... 
if I have to control pain in a patient, uh, I might as well use an agent that doesn't drastically drop blood pressure, respiratory rate, and I could use it as a sedative if I need to. Nitroglycerin would be number three. Not because of ACS. I don't really think nitro does crap for ACS. But I do think it helps in the higher doses for CHF and reducing afterload. And you have to get into the higher doses to reduce afterload, which I'm talking like 80 to 100 mics a minute, not this 10 mics a minute crap that we see. So I think it would be nitro would be the next one. Epinephrine, absolutely. Epinephrine with one milligram in one ml. This is very distracting. To no, me. It's actually perfect timing because Dr. Jeff Jarvis just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> We're going through our five medications that we would use if we had to. Yeah, Dr. Jarvis, tell us the, the five meds you thought up. Uh, you can hold it. All right. Doxycycline. <laughs> there isn't much you learn as a first-year medical student, but the one thing is nobody dies in the tropics without a dose of doxycycline. So doxycycline, ketamine, epinephrine. I'm torn between rocuronium, Versed. How about something with some evidence behind it, like aspirin? Oh, shit. Aspirin. Yes, that's good. <laughs> aspirin would be good. No, you was know that what? on the original instead? list? No, it, it was. Was, was it? Was it? Yeah. All right. I was going to say what I'd want instead is maybe some red wine, and then I wouldn't have to worry about cardiovascular disease, <laughs> and I'd be much happier. He actually said, rock you glycera, Pam. <laughs> That's that's like the the medical version of the um, oh god I'm going to screw this up Kobayashi Maru is that the right way you say that I don't know Kobayashi Maru Here, you really don't know the Kobayashi Maru you, is a test that you can absolutely not pass it's from Star Trek and it's impossible unless you go in and rig it where did he come from you are going to need so much editing on this podcast. So my five meds were Epi one to one, nitro is in there, ketamine, aspirin. My fifth one was, uh, I said Versed because I was thinking of stopping seizures. So ketamine may have some anticonvulsant properties. Definitely. Versed, without a doubt, has anticonvulsant properties. Let's go back to the nitroglycerin. Are we talking about nitroglycerin at 0.4 milligrams? In which case, then take it off altogether. We're talking about high-dose nitro for afterload reduction. Okay. All right. I'll take that then. That, that will count as one of mine. Here, just, just keep it. <laughs> Ginger, you're kicked off your own podcast. <laughs> no, she's not. <laughs> this is Start the Jarvis at mindset. Start 100 and, and go from there. 200 mics a minute for the first couple minutes. Get your afterload reduction. And then if you wanted to... 80 mics a minute is technically giving 400 micrograms a minute every five minutes. So you're not too far from giving the sublingual nitro, except you're not breaking your seal with the CPAP and de-recruiting alveoli when you do it with the drip. But you got to use a pump with it. Actually, you don't have to. There has been push-dose nitro that has been advocated for. But I would not be running nitro to gravity. Or titrate to effect. Titrate to effect basically means you don't know what the fuck you're doing. I mean, heck, you're doing. No, no, no. It's explicit. Is this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Put that little E in there. No, you're fine. So right. after I sent my list, we're still on this five five meds. Yeah, sorry. The Hashimoroto. Not even close. <laughs> Takakasubu. <laughs> oh, my God. Sushi yes. sashimi. Yes. Back to the five meds. After I sent my list, I was a little embarrassed because I forgot that we need to treat hypoglycemia. When he sent his rocuglyceripam, I thought, oh, right, D50. So why is, why is it not on your list? So here's the thing. I think you can put Aunt Jemima pancake syrup up anybody's butthole and have just as good of an effect as giving uh, D50. And I know this because I asked my mom one time. I was like, Mom, what would you do right now if I passed out? And I'm thinking she's going to say CPR. She's going to check my pulse. She's going to call 911, you know? And I said, Mom, right now I hit the floor. What are you going to do? And I encourage everyone listening to this podcast to ask the people that you spend the most time with, what would you do if I passed out right now? And my mom, without a hesitation, said, I would 
turn you over, and I would start putting pancake syrup up your butthole. And I said, before you even check a pulse? And she said, yep, because I know that hypoglycemia runs in our family, and I would be almost guaranteed that you were hypoglycemic, so you were getting Aunt Jemima up the butthole. But that's why D50 wasn't on my list. It's fine. I'm going to bring it back. (laughs) Yeah, let's bring it back in. Joel Porter, who did an excellent lecture on one of your podcasts, he told me that he considers you a mentor. And I said, well, tell me something he's taught you that he's never forgotten. And he said, the thing about Tyler is that he's wicked smart, and he's also very patient and compassionate to every single patient. And he said that you taught him to remember the ABCs, always bear compassion. I think that's extremely important. And I had a uh, I had a call that was a pivotal moment for me making that decision and realizing that it's not all about the uh, the data and the science and you know the logistics. I had a patient that was a hospice patient, you know, in private EMS sometimes you take up so- you pick up somebody from their home, you take them to a hospice center or you pick them up from a hospital, take them home to, you know, to die. And we had a patient that we were bringing to a hospice center. The patient uh, died in the ambulance. So I had a conversation with the patient. They uh, died in the ambulance with the family in the ambulance with us. And uh, the, the area we were in, the coroner would not, was not able to come pick them up right away. They were about an hour out. And we weren't able to bring the patient into the hospice facility because they couldn't accept a patient that had already died. So we had an hour, 60 minutes inside the ambulance with um, – this person that we had met who had died and the two family members. And that could turn into a super awkward situation. And I had a partner named Mark Waldron. who was very, I mean, this guy could talk to somebody in a coma for 20 minutes. I mean, he was just very into talking and communicating with patients. And we sat there and we talked about this person's entire life story, all the good memories, the funny memories, the sad memories, And that was probably the most influential call I've ever had in my career. Because then we took that same patient and we brought them to the morgue and we put them in a bag and we put them up on a shelf. And that was crazy to me because I just talked to this guy and he was, you know, obviously he's sick, but he was able to communicate with me. He was able to talk to me. And then the next thing you know, you know, we're putting him in a bag and putting him in the morgue on a shelf. And I'm like, this is how life ends. Like this guy had an entire family, a career, and this is how everything ends right here. And we had to, you know, we had to get the wedding ring off of his finger for his wife because she wanted that. And, you know, the fingers are swollen. And I started thinking about that. And I'm like, man, like life is so strange because no matter what we do right now, no matter what the accomplishments we make like this is how it ends right here and all that's left is that memory that we have made with the people that we care about and the people that we love and so if anything if when i die if people can say well tyler was you know if they say he was oh he's really good at intubating that doesn't mean anything to me but if somebody says he was super compassionate he really cared or he inspired certain people that means the world to me. So yeah, I teach that to a lot of people. And I think it's not so much teaching it. I just, I do it and then they see it and they kind of uh, feel like that's necessary now to do the same is to bear that compassion, to make sure you treat every single person with respect. You don't look at a call as just a hospice call or just a discharge, but you look at it as a moment to actually maybe make some sort of memorable moment in their life. Imagine yourself, you're back at your kitchen table, you're in high school, you're maybe a freshman, when someone asked you, what are you going to be when you grow up, freshman in high school, Tyler? What, what was your answer? An animation artist at Disney. Is that a true story? Absolutely. I lived in Lakeland, Florida, just a little bit away from Orlando. We went to Disney World all the time, and you could watch through the windows And you could see the cartoonist working on whatever the latest Disney production they were doing. Mm. And you could watch them drawing and they would be doing storyboards. And that just like really appealed to me. 
So I, I did, I got every single how to draw book there was. I carried a sketch pad around with me all the time. I was going to do that or I was going to be a stunt man in the Indiana Jones stunt show at Universal St- or MGM. Um, but no, the artist thing really stood out to me. That's what I told everybody I wanted to do. And you're a creative guy. That's what I know about you. You play guitar. All of your dabble. Pod- you dabble in the yeah. guitar. You okay. always handcraft a, a album cover, if you will, for every single episode. You got to get that creative out. Yeah, I love that creative outlet. And I try to find a picture that's going to sum it up. You know what? My huge inspiration behind that is um, Josh Farkas. He's a blogger for MCrit. He has the most unique pictures that he uses mm. for his blogs mm-hmm. and some of them are like old-fashioned mm-hmm. pictures yeah or some of them are i think rory spiegel uses more of the old-fashioned ones all right i always ask this one people know usually know it's coming because this is how we improve as a profession ever make a medical error that other people can learn from oh yeah absolutely anything you can share when i first started ems i should say when i got finished with paramedic school I was scared to death of intubating a patient. And here's why. When I did my OR time, you know how you have to do five intubations or whatever they tell you to do in the operating room. I went in with the laryngoscope and I could not see anything. I didn't recognize anything. I felt like I was putting my laryngoscope in a tub of Play-Doh. The anesthesiologist that was there with me took the laryngoscope, found the cords, said, you see the cords? I said, yeah. He said, put the tube in there. And I pushed the tube in. All right. I was like, all right, I'll do the next one. Went in the next time, could not find anything. So he found it for me, said, put the tube in. I did not get one successful intubation in the OR. He did every single one for me. As I talked to the students in my class, I realized they all kind of had the same situation None of them really able to identify anything. But here's the thing. Everybody's kind of scared to admit that. And they're like, yeah, I know everything went really well. Yeah, I got my five intubations. Uh, No, you didn't. You didn't really get those five intubations. So first call, one of my first calls that I had to RSI a patient. Drop the meds, brain bleed patient. I go in, take that laryngoscope. And there I am, just a big old tub of Play-Doh. Can't find anything, don't see anything. And I'm a field educator at this point. And I don't see anything. And I got one of these guys sitting here and he's looking at me. And I'm supposed to be like this good intubator, right? I'm a paramedic. As soon as you get that gold patch, you can intubate patients. I don't see a damn thing in there. But in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'm just going to keep digging and I'll eventually see something I recognize. And he's like, hey, Tyler, your sats are falling. I did not hear that. I keep looking. Tyler, your sats are falling. You're at 80%. All right, I pull out. I start bagging. I get them up a little bit. Get them up to like 90, 92%. All right, I'm going to go back in. I go back in. I don't see anything. And now I got some like trauma in the airway because I've already been in once, right? So I'm starting to get some a little bit of bleeding around the epiglottis. I'm getting airway full of secretions. And so I pull back out and I suction. I go back in again and I come out and I go back in again. And I was dead set on intubating this guy. I was not going to fail this airway. If I grab that combi tube or if I grab that superglottic airway, that means I failed. And that's what was programmed into my mind is that's your failed airway plan. Is to, you know, you got to grab your superglottic airway. I did not even consider that I have a paramedic partner that I should let him to intubate, right? Because I'm thinking, well, if, if I can't get it, he's not going to get it. Finally, I grabbed the combi tube. I put the combi tube in. I was not able to intubate him. I went to the ER. We got the patient there. I went in the bathroom and I was like in tears. And I'm like, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not a paramedic. I cannot intubate patients. And that just drove this fear in me that how am I going to continue with my career and not be able to intubate? I am horrible at intubating. I suck at intubating. I didn't even get the right training in school to intubate. And I was so scared of intubating that airway control became a 
addiction to me because it was the one thing that I was so scared of doing. So I went back to the station. I remember I went back. Rich Levitan has an air, has a uh, website called at air, Airway Cam, and you can just watch tons of videos of him intubating patients. And I drew for two months straight. Every day I had a notepad. I would draw the airway and I would draw the structures of the airway. And I thought I never want to be in a situation where I can't identify airway landmarks. And that began my obsession. So I went back to Lifestar and I did the training the very next month called Why I Suck at Intubation. And I walked everybody through the human factors of that call and how I failed, why I messed up, what had happened. And since that call, I have never missed an intubation. And I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm not going to ever miss an intubation, but it became an obsession. And my wife, I remember her telling me, she's like, I don't get why you go to so many airway trainings. Like you are following Jim Ducanto around. You're constantly watching videos of people intubating. And it was because I'm so scared of being in that situation where you have taken away somebody's God-given right to breathe and you're not able to get an airway in them and you're not able to intubate them. It's multifaceted, the reasons why we fail airways, but the number one reason is thinking that a supraglottic airway is failing. It's not. Some patients are going to be difficult airways. The most beneficial tip I've ever gotten is progressive laryngoscopy, is taking that blade and slowly walking it down the tongue, identifying the arytenoids, identifying you know the epiglottis, slowly looking at everything, the uvula, and then finding it. And Sam Ireland says it's so good. He does this lecture called Access Equals Access. And he's like, have you ever seen in the movies where a van pulls up and they throw a hood over somebody's head and they throw them in the van and they take them out in the middle of nowhere? That is what you're doing when you take your blade and just bury it into the hypopharynx. Because you get in there and you have no idea where you are. You didn't identify your landmarks as you got there. And I think that's extremely beneficial. But that was the mistake I made was I didn't feel prepared enough. And talking to a lot of paramedics, I know a lot of paramedics coming out of school do not feel like they are good at intubating. How can you feel good at intubating only doing five intubations in the OR and the rest of them are done on a mannequin? That just It's impossible. My response to that is there are a lot of paramedics coming out of a lot of paramedic programs that don't feel good at a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, look what we're asking of paramedics. Look what we're asking of them on the education that they've had. Yeah, I think it's normal to feel inadequate when it comes to that. You're minimally competent. Airway management is extremely, extremely important. It is the one of the most important things that we do as paramedics. And you can learn so much by watching videos of other people intubating. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really, that's what I tell everybody. Watch, go to Airway Cam or whatever Rich Levitan's website is. He just intubates. Just, I mean, there's tons of videos of him intubating and intubating. And he slowly walks the blade down, identifies the epiglottis, epiglottoscopy, he reveals it, passes the tube. Now it seems so easy that I wish I could go back and find new paramedic Tyler and be like, all right, dude, this is how you intubate. And I think the way we teach intubation has got to change a little bit. One of my favorite threads on Twitter got started by this uh, Canadian EM physician, Chris Hicks. He talked about um, what his mantra is to stay calm and under pressure. People started chiming in about what their tactics are to stay calm. And I don't know if you remember this, but you said that somebody gave you advice to hum. Was it Decanto that gave yeah, you that advice? Absolutely. Does it work? Do it you, does. Do you it do works it? phenomenal. I guarantee you, you get in a stressful situation, get an airway that you're not able to get, or get a patient that you just cannot figure out what the hell is going on with them. And you just do, 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 all right, well, we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And Jim showed me some videos in, you know, in the ICU of him with patients that are very difficult airways. And you hear the stress, you can almost feel it with everyone. And then Jim comes in and he's just humming and he's very, and it just tricks your brain into thinking everything's okay. When I turned 20, probably about 20 years old, I started getting really bad anxiety. And I got to the point to where there was about a couple months where I couldn't even leave the house. I would walk into a store, the lights would affect me. 
I would start shaking really bad. And my wife told me, she's like, listen, if you want to have kids one day, like you've got to get on some medication because I couldn't go out in public. It was super bad. I was reading a ton of different information on how to trick your brain into thinking everything is okay. Cause it wouldn't be anything that would even trigger it. It would just be randomly out of nowhere. One of the things was if you just sing to yourself, your brain tricks itself into thinking everything is okay. I think that that's been huge. And obviously you don't want to be disrespectful and be in a situation and you're sitting there, you know, humming chitty, chitty, bang, bang while you're trying to intubate somebody. But I think that it does not only improve you, but everybody around you. Cause they're thinking, all right, we are now in control of the situation. So yeah, I'll start to hum a little bit. I'll start talking very calm. The worse the situation gets, probably the calmer I'll talk and all right. Hey, nice job, man. You're doing good. Yeah. No, nice work with this. All right. All right. You got that tube. All right. You know, like we start trying to to lighten the mood a little bit because the worst thing you can do in a situation where a patient is crashing is mentally start crashing yourself and start going, Oh my God, okay, this isn't working. What are we? And then everybody likes to play the blame game with each other. And what are you doing? You didn't do this. And where's that at? And it just doesn't, it turns into a huge mess when that happens. This is something I do. I notice when trauma recesses come into the trauma center, I started noticing I was doing a little, mm, I don't know where it came from. No one taught me to do it. It just started coming out. So I was curious when you said that you hum. What tune is that? I don't know what it is. What is it? Heart and Soul. Heart Heart and Soul. soul, That's right. That is, yep. That was Jimmy Apple with the identification. In episode seven, I interviewed a medic who had done a surgical crike. In that episode, we talked about the fact that always throughout my education, everyone that taught me how to do a surgical crack, they said, you can go your whole career and never do this. That was just a consistent message I got. It was a mindset that I took. I'm like, I probably won't ever use this. Um, And I really didn't walk into calls ever expecting to use that skill and expected if I ever did have to use the skill that I would probably be questioned. What was it like to do your first surgical crack? It was actually a very relaxing situation. So we had just opened up a 911 area and I went up there to kind of work the first couple of shifts while we were still recruiting staff in that area. We got a call for a cardiac arrest. We got up there and the uh, patient was PMB. And they said that she had just had a pulse, lost it, and her jaw was clenched tight, right? So they're doing CPR. Uh, my partner, I said, hey, you know, can you able to put, intubate? And he's like, no, the jaw's clenched tight. I said, can you sneak, a, can you sneak some sort of superglottic airway in there? Nope. And so we were working it, and I said, all right, we're going to do a surgical airway then. Jaw was clenched completely tight. We talked about, you know, intra-arrest paralytics. Is that something we should do? I said, no. You know what? We need to get an airway. Let's do it. So I, uh, I grabbed the scalpel. I made the cut put my finger in, slid the bougie down, put the tube in, very little blood. Uh, tube went in, got a rush of end tidal CO2 out. Initially, I was like, oh, let's check a pulse. Uh, we never got a pulse back. And that was my first surgical airway. And so I got done with it. I went up and I called uh, Dr. DeCanto. I said, Jim, listen, this is what happened. Do you think it was justified? Because you don't hear people doing surgical airways on PMBs that often, or you know, pulseless non-breathing patients, cardiac arrest. And he said, yeah, you know what you just told me? And I was like, what? He said, you just told me that you're not dead until you have an airway and you're dead. And he's like, and I think that that is extremely beneficial because you gave, you, you set up an airway as soon as possible. You established it. It was successful. Don't look back. But I thought about it. And I'm like, well, was it justified? And so I did an article actually on foam frat. It was a blog called you're not dead until you have an airway. And we compared intra-arrest paralytics versus uh, intra-arrest surgical airways and the pros and cons of both. And I think the general uh, position from that was, yeah, if you have somebody who's got clenched teeth, don't be dicking around with trying to shove a tube down their nose and, you know, pushing on the cricoid membrane and trying to shove. No, cut to air, get that airway in, 
make it happen. So that was my first one. And, um, you know, the patient was already in cardiac arrest. So it really mm-hmm. wasn't that hard. And it set me up nice because then I had a two following it the next year that I felt a lot more comfortable after I had done that one. Um, but it's very, you know, it's, I would say it's rare. It's not common that somebody goes into cardiac arrest and gets instantaneous trismus. And a lot of people say, oh, that must have been rigor. That patient must mm-hmm. have been, you know, down for a long time, you clown. But that really wasn't the case at all. They reported that she just went down. So who knows what it caused it. There's a lot of uh, documentation on this instantaneous rigor. But that, that was my first one. I felt like from the moment I started that cut to the moment I had that airway was probably about 35, 40 seconds or so. And I had practiced a bazillion times on mannequins on each other with using a pen practicing. And it went very smooth on each other with a pen. Like you would mark where you would cut. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't, I don't like the standalone crike models because they don't teach you how to navigate the real estate of the body and the chest and the head. So you just have this tiny little neck and then everybody kind of positions himself really weird with it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you take a marker, a pen, and you have your partner lay on a table and you position yourself and the hand you are dominant on that side of the patient. And then you just draw a line where you would draw your incisions. How how tall would you say your vertical incision is? Typically, that vertical incision is probably about an inch and a half or so. That vertical incision should be pretty pretty deep. Deep? Pretty long. Long. Yeah. I've now, the horizontal one, that's more of a puncture. Puncture, yeah. 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 The vertical incision, I've taught students, and this is just me kind of winging it, telling them how, where I would start. I kind of think to start at the prominence of the thyroid cartilage like the the bony prominence start there what what do you think yeah i 100 percent agree so i position my hand my right actually it'd be my left hand and i grab the trachea and then i'm going to use my pointer finger and i'm going to slowly slide that up and the most common mistake is to make that cut too proximal and you don't go distal enough So you want to make it wide enough. If you can't feel your landmarks, just make that cut because the skin is going to separate and you're going to start to be able to feel those landmarks a lot better. Because face it, if you're doing a surgical airway, it's probably a patient that doesn't have the best anatomy or it's a patient that has a lot of adipose tissue. And in that podcast I just did uh, called Making the Cut, I actually put GoPro cams on some of our medics when I worked at Lifestar. And we had the needle, the percutaneous crike, and they had to decide where they were going to put that needle. And when you can't feel your landmarks, you're not able to commit to one spot. But when you have a scalpel, you're like, all right, this is center. This is midline. I'm going to make my cut. And they start making those cuts. And then the landmarks start revealing themselves. You and Sam Ireland recently brought on Dr. Cynthia Griffith onto your foam frat team. Yeah. She's one of the few flight physicians in the country, yeah? Yeah, she is. She's amazing. And I got to meet her at the Wisconsin conference and see her speak, and I completely get why you guys would want to collaborate with her. I talked to her, too, and here's what she said about you. He just brings out the best in everyone he meets. He continues to push himself to be a better clinician and inspires me to continue to push myself as well. I think this is part of what sets him apart. It's that he makes others want to continue to push themselves and learn more because of his passion for foam ed. Can you explain to the listeners what the heck foam ed is? So free open access medical education. And anybody's listening to your podcast probably already knows what foam ed is, but maybe they're not. Maybe they stumbled across this while perusing Facebook. Foam ed is a movement right now. It's people taking their own time, putting out content for absolutely nothing for free. The only thing they get out of it is maybe a little bit of Uh, encouragement, uh, some adrenaline release from comments and people engaging in their work. Before, people who got involved in uh, science, and they were kind of the nerds, right? And the cool people were like the people who didn't really care. And now the cool people are the ones that are actually engaging and trying to be better and trying to be better and improve themselves. 
And Cynthia stands out to me as one of these people because there's no level. There's no MD and paramedic and EMT and first responder. She reached out to me before she was even on Foam Frat. And she's like, hey, I was listening to your podcast on the way to the ER today. Here's an, an ER physician listening to a paramedic podcast. And I was just like blown away by it. Where else do you see that? I mean, you talk about multidiscipline, uh, different faculty and different people involved. Yeah, breaking down the silos. They're breaking that down and we're all like learning from each other. We're all taking care of patients. And so that's what really stood out to me about Cynthia was that she did not look at the different levels of provider. What did you go to school for? Well, I'm only going to talk to you uh, based on what's on your name badge. It was based off of passion. And that's how I am too. If I find somebody who's passionate, they could be anybody in the system. But I say, wow, I really want to cue into this person because I see that there's something about you I can learn from. Jim Ducanto has been a huge inspiration on me. And that's because of the same thing. It's when you break down those barriers and we go, you know what? We all take care of sick patients. Let's learn from each other. And then all of a sudden, you take away the intimidation, you take away any egos, you strip it all away, and all you have left is just these columns of things that we can learn from each other. And so foam ed really is breaking down the barriers. I mean, look at us. We're all sitting in this room right now, and I know you guys listening are not able to see this, but you got Dr. Jeff Jarvis, uh, you got Jay Nance, who's an EMT, you got Ginger, who's a paramedic, Jimmy, I mean, his wife, you got all these different levels. We're all sitting around, hanging out. Amy Eisenhower, EMT. Amy Eisenhower in the house. And it's free. And open access. And to me, the free piece is what brings together like the kindred spirit is that we are, we're just doing it because we love it. Absolutely. And you know what? It's not, it's not free to the people that are doing it. Correct. You know that. We pay for websites we pay for uh, server space we put out our podcast you take a lot of your own time it's not free it's we, we provide this for free for our listeners do you remember who your first mentor was or a role model that you had yeah my first role model in ems was absolutely scott weingart i think everybody knows that he's probably like one of my like i don't know he's he, he's definitely a mentor and the thing is is the guy doesn't even know who i am but I listened to him nonstop when I first started EMS. And I liked that he broke down everything into not just saying, okay, well, you're going to go and you're going to put a patient on CPAP and do this and this and that. Uh, but he would break down the logistics of everything. And he had such a passion for it that I just was immediately drawn to. And it was funny because whenever I get to a point, like I just started a new job. So I just started as a flight paramedic for LifeLink 3. It was scary going from being an absolute, like, to being a new guy. And I went from LifeStar, where I had been there for 10 years, to now working at this place to where I was brand new. Nobody knew me from Adam. And not only did I start at a new place, but I moved to a new area. And so I would drive to uh, orientation. So it was like a two-week orientation period. And I had like an hour drive. I had to get up at like four in the morning, five in the morning to get there. And I would be like shaking nervous. I was so, I have a really high anxiety. I take medication for anxiety. And so I'd be like, oh man, like this, I'm just nervous about this. And I put on an MCRIT podcast on like uh, expertise or a different mind of the resuscitationist. And it would actually give me like confidence just listening to those podcasts. And I would get there and I feel like, all right, I feel good now. I feel positive about it. The other thing is I would call Jim Ducanto and I'd talk to him and I'd be like, hey man, sorry I'm bothering you this early, but you know, this is what I'm doing right now. What do you think about this? And Jim is just, I mean, he's fantastic. I told him the other day, I'm like, I should really start calling you Dr. Ducanto, but I always you know, call him Jim. But he is just, amazing when it comes to trying to feed you confidence and let you know that, hey, man, what you're doing is fantastic. I support you 110%. Uh, so there's been a lot of different mentors in EMS. Uh, Sam Ireland, Scott Weingart, Jim Ducanto, a lot of people. Thanks for sharing that you have anxiety going to work this many years into EMS. I mean, I think that's something that everyone can relate to um, and something I hope that the listeners um, 
helps them kind of normalize their experience. I've heard of physicians, like when they first start going to the ER, that they'll they'll talk about, um, you know, like physically being ill, driving for like the first six months of going to the ER. So it's a it's a universal experience. And here you are, I mean, how many years into EMS, but it's a new, you're on the edge, you're kind of on the bubble of your comfort, you're in your growth place. Uh, and it's still, it's still hard. And that's why I did it, because you get addicted to that feeling of taking yourself out of your comfort zone and then getting comfortable in that new uh, domain that you're in. And so I knew I wanted to do it. I was way too comfortable at my old job and I didn't re- I wasn't growing at all and I thought, you know what? Like if you want to be a good ball player, you got to go play with people that are better than you. And so that's what I wanted to do is I wanted to find people that were and would, granted the guys at Lifestar were amazing. But I wanted to try something new. I'd never done helicopter EMS before. I'd never been involved with aviation on that aspect. And so it was completely a new ball game for me. But it was, it's been so cool. It's taught me a whole new level of skills that I never even knew that I needed to know. But it's helped me actually with the medicine aspect as well. So imagine you got fired from your new job. You're going back to ground transport. Yeah. But the good news. Your first shift is with your favorite partner of all time. You just dreamed him up, I hope. I already know who he is. He's got a name. All right. So what qualities does this person have that makes them your favorite? They got to make me laugh. They have to make me laugh. Um, when We work 24-hour shifts at my old job, and so... Uh, you would be up at three in the morning. You know, we'd be going through Taco Bell drive throughs after calls. And if the person didn't have a good sense of humor, it was, it was so hard to get through a 24 hour shift with. If I had to say the different components of a partner that make them very appealing, somebody who cares about their job, somebody who respects patients, respects you as a provider, has a good sense of humor. All of those things are extremely important to me. Um, they don't have to be the smartest person in the world. That's not what I. You know, that's not what we're looking for. And as in, like a field training officer, or we call them field educators. You can train people to do that stuff. It's really hard to train people to just be fun to hang out with. So that's the number one thing right there. Is somebody that you can live with for twenty four hours, tolerate them. They can take critique. They're extremely honest with you. You're extremely honest with them. And you guys can laugh your asses off in the ambulance while working a 24-hour shift. You guys called them field educators. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Because language matters. Yeah. And a field training officer implies technician level um, education. It applies authority, too. Mm, Yeah. Officer. Officer. Good point. Yeah. I was thinking of the um, training part, like Mm. an instructor or a trainer, whereas I like to call myself an educator as well. Where'd that word come from? Field educator. Do you know? Yeah, I I came up with that. So I did not like the word officer and I didn't want this person to have authority and they were like this, you know, ranking individual. They were an educator. They had whiteboards at their station. They were on your level. They were just facilitating information. And, you know, like it was just the nomenclature, but I really feel like that made a huge difference because people wouldn't take themselves as, oh, I'm an officer or I have, you know, these bugles on my collar. And they were, they were an educator. They were you, but they were somebody who's good at teaching. And I feel like a field training officer, you get that role the majority of the time by experience. So this person has been a paramedic for 10 years. Let's make them an FTO. I made a guy, a field educator named Matt Sox, who was only involved in our organization for maybe six months because he was a phenomenal educator. He liked to teach education and being a good educator has absolutely zero to do with how long you've been in the field. And I felt really strongly about that. And I was very fortunate that my boss felt the same way, but yeah, I thought it went really well. Each station had their own field educator. They set up community events, education events. They had a whiteboard at their station. They would write little questions to try to get people engaged in them. And it worked really, it worked extremely well. My favorite human experience is feeling something like where somebody just reframed something for me completely that I hadn't thought to reframe like that, like field training officer to field educator. That's awesome. That's how we change culture and that's what you've consistently done every single time I talk to you 
it's why people gravitate to you, Tyler. Oh, I appreciate that. Do you routinely put C collars on people you've intubated? I do not routinely do it, but I have done it in you know the past. This, you know this idea, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the idea is that you don't get the flexion and the extension of the head? Yeah. I've been thinking about this one, and I want your, your thought process on it. C collars, we know, can restrict venous return from the head. Yeah. And who do we intubate? Very often, head injured patients. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't think that it's necessary. I think that uh, sometimes you're getting a patient out of a ditch or you're extricating them out of a car and you don't want their neck moving around a lot. You throw the C-collar on them for that. If a patient has a cervical spine injury, obviously, I think it's probably necessary to have them on a collar. Just to throw a collar on because they're intubated probably isn't probably isn't the most uh, beneficial thing to do. I started worrying that we're we're hurting them. All right, I want to close with how Mike Verkes described you. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, let's just go to a commercial right now. And- he put into words exactly how I view you. So the question I asked him was, tell me something Tyler taught you. Because on Facebook, he had said, thanks for everything you've taught me. He said, I think for me, it's less about something he taught me, and it's more about a connection I have on a deeper level when I feel like I'm automatically open to learning from him no matter what he's teaching. And I saw that at Wimsa when you were teaching the salad technique. Uh, you're a natural teacher. You told me that you think that you might write a book about education. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so my dream would be to come out with a book. And I thought at first I wanted to do it on cardiology because I was just so into cardiology. It was my favorite thing to talk about. And then I got really into airway. And I was like, all right, I'm going to come up. Me and Sam were going to write an airway book. And we were just extremely jazzed about that. I realized that there's so many smarter people out there to write cardiology. You know, you got Dr. Steve Smith, you got Tom Boothelay, an airway book. You got Jeff Jarvis, Jim DeCanto, Rich Levitan. I'm like, I'm not going to write anything that somebody doesn't already know. I'm just going to be regurgitating information that I heard from somebody before. So I thought, what is it that I can bring to the table if I wanted to write a book before I die? You know, some book that'll sit on a crusty old library shelf. The idea behind the book was the Clinical Educators Atlas, and it was going to be how to teach different concepts in medicine, because there's two things that we need to do to make a difference in our career, take really good care of patients and to teach other people how to take really good care of patients. Every single provider needs to be a teacher. They go hand in hand. We should almost have a module in the paramedic class on how to teach people other topics because not only are we teaching patients about their health condition, we're teaching each other as well. And so that was the idea, and that is the idea behind this book, is that it'll go through chapters on how to teach the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve in a non-intimidating way, how to teach people that just because their rate is over 150, it is not freaking SVT, and SVT is a umbrella term, and it's actually AV nodal reentry tachycardia, and to quit giving adenosine to sinus tachycardia just because of a rate-related issue. And I just want to go through each condition, all little pet peeves, soapboxes, have illustrations, and teach people how to teach certain types topics. This would be beneficial for one, for teachers, but two, for providers who want to learn these different concepts as well. So that's my idea behind the book. And we'll see if that ever happens. Every single time one of your new episodes come out, I listen to it. Like if I'm in the middle of teaching, I go to the bathroom and hide and listen. No way. Uh, The second it comes out, I listen. The second this book comes out, I will be all over it. Thank you, Tyler. No, thank you. I've been looking forward to this. Everybody needs to be in the same room with you at least one point in their life. I, I hope any any listeners will uh, make a point to come to conferences where you're speaking or uh, find you on uh, your various platforms. So where can they find you on the internet? So you can go to foamfrat.com. You can go on Facebook and look up Tyler Christofoli on Twitter at Christofoli88. Or they can just Google Tyler Christofoli. Or you can look up on YouTube, Aisle 31, A-I-S-L-E 31. And that was my band that I was in when I was really young. And I don't tell anybody this, but if you look it up on YouTube, A-I-S-L-E 31 is my band. And you will see videos of me when I was 13 years old playing in bars. 
That's on the internet. It's on the internet. Yeah. That's awesome. And what's cool is Jay is sitting right here. He was just a little kid and he would sit out in the audience with his own little guitar and he would play. <laughs> Did he just bring up a picture? Are you in there? Yeah. That's me. They're holding. What? They're holding you? Isn't that crazy? You're Look the baby? How, yeah. He's the baby in that picture. Oh. I just promoted my band right now. <laughs> Never mind the foam ed stuff. No. This is, is it, this is actually all about me coming back out with my band. <laughs> it's an awesome to know you and it's I great you, to call Ginger. you a friend. The, the love is mutual. Thank you so much. Fist bump. Mm. Good luck editing this podcast. No, I'm just gonna leave it as it is. No. You're on your own, man. <laughs> hey guys, Miss Tyler. All my episodes end up sounding like pillow talk, someone told me. Really? Mm-hmm. I actually like that because you can whisper into the ears of your listener. It, this is an important factual thing. So what is so great about the Kobayashi Maru? What is it about it that makes it? Why, how do I know about it? Basically, the Kobayashi Maru, it teaches people, too, that you're going to have to accept circumstances that you're not going to be able to succeed in. You're going to fail no matter what. It's an impossible test. Huh. So why, why do we know about it? Kirk. Kirk. How did he pass it? He went and rigged it. He rewrote the basic uh, coding behind it so he could beat it. So the moral of the story is when you find yourself in an absolutely unwinnable circumstance, change the rules. Hmm. Stop limiting yourself to how you've been told to think about something think about it in a different way kirk did that this is the reason we all know who captain kirk is i like that kobayashi maru